Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, it's uh, indeed a privilege to be here to share my journey with you all. Um, I'll straight away jump into uh, what I came here to say, but before that, I just want to give uh, some background to this. So I'm basically an electronics and communications engineer by qualification and uh, a postgraduate in business. So the only connection that I had with agriculture about five years uh, earlier was I was on the other side of the table enjoying all the uh, benefits of food. So why does someone like me start anything, right? So the why is the most important question. So I thought today I wanted to share the journey of why uh, or what are the things that made me want to do uh, what I did. So, everything starts with an idea, and I mean, and everybody understands that. A few years back, I accidentally came across a report from IFCA, Indian Federation of Culinary Association, which did a survey on uh, uh, the toxicity levels of uh, food that was available in our city. So they go to random places, pick the fresh produce, give it for lab testing. And the startling revelation was the most uh, poisonous and toxic food that we are consuming on a day-to-day -day basis was mint, followed by coriander. And this was shocking for me because um, I'm typically from a South Indian family and this is everyday staple for us, right? You can't live without your rasams and your mint chutneys uh, on a daily basis. And, and I felt this was uh, completely wrong. But then suddenly a thought came to my head saying, but then we've got options now, right? Like we can always switch to organic, we can switch to um, a premium brand of produce. And just for a few seconds, I, I started feeling better. But, but then a very horrible feeling struck into me again, like saying, but what about those who actually cannot afford to go to an organic store or who can't go actually to a, a you know, um, high-end retail? Let's, let's keep it that way. So uh, this thought started building itself in me, right? So little by little, I started feeling that it is our moral responsibility as a society to ensure that every single person who's sharing this planet, it's not about a country, it's not about a state, it's not about any boundary. This space that we share with every single human. Imagine when you have three meals a day, there's a kid there not even having access to one single meal. And this thought started getting uh, even more stronger because I am a father to a three-year-old and I know what that feeling is. When, when my daughter just doesn't get one meal, she goes really crazy. And imagine there are kids who are just making by uh, with not even a single meal. So this kind of became the mission uh, which uh, drove uh, me to do whatever I did. And I'm going to go into that um, um, stages that, that I went through uh, for me to kind of jump into what we did, right? By 2050, whether we know it or not, we're going to be 10 billion people. We are actually three times more than what the Earth intended for us to be, right? And by that time, we're going to be having uh, a need for 70% more food. So that sounds um, extremely uh, like a figure that's unviable, simply because you know that 70% of the Earth is filled with the ocean, only 30% is land, and in the land we have to balance between the ecosystem of forest and uh, food production. So at the current rate, if we actually expand 70%, there won't be any land left unless we start sea farming. So this kind of put a serious question in my mind, right? So. Uh, we are a country that uh, launched the Mangalyan, and we are the country that's going to launch the next bullet trains. So obviously we would have figured this all out. We would have had the technology by now to gear up for this change. And I wanted to know it. But while I was thinking through this, suddenly an image flashed in my head. The image which disturbed me a lot, because that's the image of the Indian farmer. Um, so the, the uh, lady who introduced me, sorry, I forgot her name, uh, she actually mentioned that, right? What do you think when you think of an uh, Indian farmer? What is the image? So take a few seconds and just think, right? I don't know about most of you. For me, I could just get the picture of two hungry cows and a skinny man. And this, maybe this is programmed 
for years, maybe looking at our Indian stamp or whatever it was, but this was the honest image that came to my head when I uh, visualized an Indian farmer. So I said, look, I can't have a conversation with God, but I can go one step closer. So I went to Google, typed in Indian farmer, and I was right. This is the first page of Google with all the AI. They could come up with our level of technology in agriculture with this, right? This image says it all. Like the only technology that we think that we have, which still science is dabbling with, is this last image here of the man praying, right? Because we still don't know if that science works or not. And if you look, one more important thing, the first tab that marked the Indian farmer says poor. So that's how the world or even Google classifies an Indian farmer today. I put the same theory to an American farmer. This is the image I got on the first page of Google, right? So they're obviously looking much more healthy, more confident. There's a lot of tech in the background. So this kind of really um, gave me some perspectives on how we look at ourselves and how we look at our farmers and how everybody else looks at their farmers, right? And this was one of the articles that came out of India today, which really opened my eye to the farmer. We keep blaming the farmer for not giving us clean food, for saying different things, but we never really look at what's going on in their lives. We are a country where we house 120 million farmers, out of which every half an hour a farmer is committing suicide as we speak. And in, in the 120 million farmers, uh, almost 40% do not like farming. They do not want to do farming. They don't want their next generation to get into farming. And the experts in the agricultural industry, they say that for a farmer to be viable, you need at least one hectare land per farmer. And uh, the irony is, out of all the farmers we have, more than 70% of them have less than one hectare. And you know what's more troubling? As we move along, the father will split that land to his two sons and they will further. So as we progress, farming is becoming more and more unviable in its current form and shape. So this is a serious problem, right? Like, just imagine, per day, 2,000 farmers are quitting farming. Forget about the 70% increase in food that we are looking at. As on date, 2,000 farmers are quitting on a daily basis. Why won't they quit? An average income of a farming family is 6,000 rupees. An average income of a security guard in one of the uh, gates in a city is about 8,000 rupees. So think about it, all that backbreaking work um, and the uncertainties of climate, weather, nature, all of that, he may or may not get that 6,000 for his family. All he has to do is wear a blue color uniform, sit on a chair from morning to evening and he can feed his family three times a day. If we worry about our family, I think he has the right to worry about his as well. This kind of makes me realize that it's not the farmer, it's not anything else, but the entire system is broken. The entire food supply chain is broken, right? And this is the right time for us to rethink the whole thing. We have to start reimagining food. And this is the most interesting part of uh, uh, my uh, learning in this whole journey, right? I think what we ate 50 years back was very different from what we are consuming as a population today. And 50 years from now, what we are going to have is going to be completely different from what we are eating today. Who knows, we could have cricket salads and uh, octopus uh, or squid ink juices because the world is changing drastically and as we speak, people have already started looking at insect protein and all the other things as uh, a viable source of uh, food. Now, if you take food and you actually ask the simple question, what is food? Can you define food? Food is something that does not cause you long-term or short-term harm and that actually gives you nourishment. If you just take the simple analogy, you walk into a supermarket today, I don't know how many products you can actually take out of that and walk back home. This is the current state of consumption that we are in, and we need to drastically relook and rethink at this uh, environment. The new food needs to be put into a spectrum, a framework, where we are looking at nutrition. Let me just give you a heads up on nutrition, right? India as a country, we are still talking about calorie per person. For example, a healthy male requires about 2,000 calories per day. But how much nutrition in that calorie, nobody knows. So which means you can eat rice all day and you can get your carbs, but you would not actually have any of the calories that is required for you to uh, be a healthy person, right? You might not have your primary nutrients or your secondary nutrients or your micronutrients in that composition. Whereas the rest of the developed world have gone far ahead of this. They're not thinking calories per 
human, they are thinking nutrition per calorie. Now, this is a very interesting thought, right? Because what this does is it changes the way we actually do agriculture. Um, kind of sad to say this, but we often boast that we are the rice bowl, we are the sugar bowl, we are the uh, largest cotton manufacturer, uh, we are the uh, largest wheat manufacturer, even dairy. For the last two decades, we have been growing, uh, we have been like raising cattle for milk and we, we take pride in saying we are the largest milk producer. I think we are missing the elephant in the room. The whole world, I have a feeling, have, have really thought this through and we have still not caught on to the game. What they have decided is they have classified crops on the basis of the most important element for agriculture, water. You know, right, I, I always feel nice about somebody who comes and says, hey, you've not closed your tap, that little bit water is dripping. But the funny part is that constitutes only 5% of the total water consumed. All our domestic consumption, everything put together constitutes only 5%. Agriculture constitutes 90% of our water utilization. In the future, wars are going to be fought on water. And how India uses its water? We don't know, we've not really thought this through, right? All of these crops require at least 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 times more water than what the other guys are actually doing, right? The developed world has cherry-picked the nutrition via square feet, via calorie, and they have taken away all the value to one side, and they have said, this is the low-value curve, right? This is the commodity. So, any developing country, any third world country can consume its own water resources and can develop this because we don't need to uh, make all these commodities. We can always buy this from them because the Indian farmer does not factor the most important raw material in the whole part of agriculture, it's the water. So the way we have to look at the future of food has to be completely different. We have to calculate square feet vs nutrition vs uh, the calorie in it. So all of this data really upset me because I, I, I came across all of this and I had to do something about it. Like I felt morally obliged to do something about it and I had no connection with agriculture whatsoever. But I just knew that maybe it's the era of technology, right? There would be some technology somewhere that we can use to address this problem. We also know that by 2020, 60% of the world will be living in urban jungles. The urbanization would have taken place. And these urban cities will not spring upon by itself, right? It has to displace something. It's going to displace more farmlands and become cities. So if food is going further away from you, how are you going to manage this crisis? The only way forward was urban farming, where you can grow things at smaller places with higher intensity and with technologies that enable you to, uh, enable you to produce more out of less. In this mission, in this search, I came across hydroponics. Hydroponics is a science of growing plants directly on water without any soil. So this, to some people, may be startling because for the longest time, even I was thinking that everything grows out of soil. Technically speaking, you don't need soil to grow plants. It's only a support structure, and you can replicate everything else directly on water. What this does, the benefit of hydroponics is we save 90% water, and this lets us do vertical farming, which means because we are not dependent on soil, I can grow one layer on top of the other and top of the other. And because I'm not dependent on soil, it doesn't matter uh, whether the soil is rocky, whether the quality of the soil is bad, or um, it's a beach. It can be wherever, it can be parking lots, basements, rooftops, all of them can be converted into food production entities. So, this is what inspired us, and I was alone in this uh, in the beginning, right? So I, I just started off, and I thought if I was just a matchstick here, if I could just light this fire, then maybe some change will happen. I'll just play my part, and maybe I won't feel this guilty afterwards. But to my surprise, I found a whole army of people who have the exact same cause, and they approached us, and at some point, we became a company. It was a project, it became a company, and companies needed to pay salary, right? Wrong. These people didn't even want salaries. They actually put in money to work for the company because the cost was that important to them. About 12, 13 people dedicated themselves to this cause, and we started building this. And our single point idea was, how do you take a concept like this to a country like India? We have to go after the influencers. And influencers are not 300 miles away in a farm. They're actually in your houses. They're actually the people living in cities. So we started making uh, kitchen garden kits, 
toys, basically. And then we said, look, if we can take this to every single household, if every kid can be inspired, if they can be sensitized towards food, then they will start a conversation with their parents. And these people will start recognizing what technology and sustainable farming is. And through that, we can spread this awareness. That's how this project started. It kind of slowly grew, and we shifted. Uh, as we made more money, we made a rooftop farm. And the rooftop farm, the idea was simple, right? Jugad is the, is the one thing that powers India. Everything needs to be done just in time, in a way, uh, and with whatever you find there. We wanted to have a professional way of approaching rooftops. We wanted to understand the problem of rooftops. We wanted to understand the problem of people living in cities. They don't have time. They don't have water. They, they don't want to get their hands dirty. They want to travel and come back after 10 days. Hydroponics fit into all of this. We put all the systems in place so that they could just go standardize, retrofit a rooftop and, and uh, without any impact to the roof itself. This was uh, uh, kale that is grown in one of the rooftops in one of our modular units. Now every family can start producing food. In a little by little uh, way, they can start understanding the process of producing food. We are creating a new range of farmers. People who are housewives now can reimagine themselves to be food entrepreneurs. They can be the next leg of farmers, the one that India needs to solve this gap. The same farm that we did, the rooftop farm, uh, we are growing some exotics there. And this is supplied to almost 30 restaurants in the vicinity itself. So it's not just uh, something that is out of, uh, you know, someone's good intention, but it's also extremely viable as a business. This was a project where we played with medicinal plants. And uh, we, so one of the things that I was working on is why not look at those things that others are not looking at? Why not look at our history, our past? You know, we have so many Ayurvedic herbs, and if we could use new technology and our ancient tradition, marry them across, and this was a great success. In fact, uh, some of the leading institutes are now deploying this for uh, their uh, production as well. This is one of my colleagues. He's extremely proud of his work. He's just created purple leaf basil on his uh, rooftop. This was a project. So this is the new face of an urban farmer. He's a musician by profession. He lives out of Mumbai. And this urban farm is from Chennai. This is the uh, bear skeletal. And each of these products were indigenized by us, right? We used locally available materials so that the cost barrier can be broken. And every year, we set goals for ourselves to bring down the cost of technology so that more and more farmers and more and more crops can be included in this portfolio. I will just leave you with one last thought. This is something that is very close to me. What we are achieving to do is a project called Palak Project. 50% of the women in India are anemic, and 50% of the children are suffering from stunted growth. So this mainly comes out of iron deficiency. We wanted to marry the corporates with this kind of uh, problem. So we said, if every commercial rooftop can house a farm like this and grow only spinach, People from the underprivileged families, especially women folk, can be employed in those farms, and these farms can be set up using the CSR budget, and the minute I put a rooftop farm, the cooling efficiency of the building goes up 20%. Now, these women who are actually working there will produce these palaks, and imagine if these palaks are bundled and sent to organizations like Akshay Patra, where they cook the midday meal scheme. A child requires 12 grams of protein and 50 grams of vegetables on a daily basis. And imagine if that 50 grams of vegetable is substituted 20 grams of spinach, which is high in uh, iron content, we could pretty much uh, make a big dent on the uh, anemia as a, a problem. And with just one corporate farm, we can feed 4,500 children per month. So if, and we are working towards a goal like this, and someday we see that when you take off on your flight, we want to see every rooftop covered with a hydroponic farm. Thank you.